Hi, I'm Catherine Reed Day, host of the St. Paul Forum, and coming up next is an interview with Patricia Kirkpatrick, poet and Minnesota Book Award winner. That's next on the St. Paul Forum. Welcome to the St. Paul Forum. I'm Catherine Reed Day, and joining me today is Patricia Kirkpatrick, poet and Minnesota Book Award winner. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you. I'm so happy you're here. We're going to confess right up front that we knew each other many, many years ago. Um, your, your sister, Joey, was a friend of mine in high school in Des Moines, Iowa, and my picture in my mind of, is of you and your sisters in the kitchen. So that's my memory oh. of you. But oh. I've been so fun to follow your career as a poet now that we're both living mm -hmm. in a different city. Mm -hmm. So um, tell us a little bit about uh, when you started writing. I've already said where you grew up, but tell us a little bit about uh, when you started and uh, how you committed yourself to the life of poetry. Okay. You know, I started at Hillis Elementary School in Des Moines. In second grade, I had a teacher who had us all write poetry. And I was really good at it, which I took for granted because I was so bad at everything else, like <laughs> sports and math. Um, but those poems got sent to whatever the educational station was in Des Moines. And so sometimes I would go to church and people would say, oh, I heard your poem on the radio last week. Really? So uh, it was kind of a privileged and, and probably an inaccurate way to uh, see how poetry uh, was integrated into daily life. But I still give a lot of credit to um, teachers, libraries, books, the Des Moines Art Center for making an environment where those things seem possible. Um, That's lovely. I think, you know, as a person from Des Moines, I've, I've often felt that the, mm -hmm. the, little, the environment I was put into, mm -hmm. I grew up with magazines everywhere in the house Absolutely. and, you know, a variety. The New Yorker was in my home mm -hmm. all the time. Um, and I think we do take, we don't understand just how vital that civic infrastructure is to fostering all these other things. So we both got to be the product of that right. environment. So I love hearing that, but I had no idea that you'd been, had your poems. So how old were you when I your first poem? I was seven years old. When eight your years first poem old. was read on the yeah. radio? Wow. And I can remember my teacher was Luella Streffler. Uh, I think I, I actually acknowledge her in my first book of poetry. Um, I can remember standing beside her as she was typing up everyone's poem, and I was so thrilled to see mine being typed that I picked it up before she was finished. And she said, I can't type your poem if you don't <laughs> leave it where it is. But also having lived in uh, San Francisco for 10 years, I, I know what the rest of America's attitude is about the Midwest, although that certainly has changed now. And um, the level of literacy and commitment to the arts is is really quite extraordinary and I think unexpected in other places in America. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, we can talk a little bit more about that. So the um, this is not your first book of poetry, but we will just say this one has just now been honored for the Minnesota Book Award in Poetry. And we'll talk a little bit more about the award in a minute, but talk a little bit about the the process that you've gone through. What did, You started writing. Did you write in college? Did you write uh, when you... How did that go? You know, in my family, no one had been to college before. Um, and so I very much wanted to go, as did all my sisters, and there weren't a lot of choices. Um, I went to the University of Iowa, and lo and behold, there's the yeah. Iowa Writers <laughs> Workshop. There you which go is, again. It seems like you were is, meant to write, I, I think so, too. I, it was <laughs> if you were at the Writers Workshop, World then. famous, but my dear mother, may she let, uh, rest in peace, always thought I should write and study English and of course I wanted no part of that in high school and for actually for a good part of college until I sort of saw the light so um, was it the resistance just simply because it was mother-daughter or was there some other resistance I, I don't think it was that as much as you know you and I were talking earlier there was such a pull for me or I actually should call it a push to get out of the Midwest that I think I associated anything with my upbringing or background with 
something to abandon and you know throwing out the baby with the bathwater the way many of us do so I think that was it more than any I mean I didn't even start studying English at the University of Iowa studying political science and history and all those things which I thought were much more important and, and more interesting I don't mm -hmm. necessarily think that now but and then it was my senior year in college where I started taking writing courses from people in the writing workshop and I was I, I'd signed on shall we say yeah and did you do graduate work or did you stay? Then I did. That was okay. actually why initially I went to San Francisco um, to study. Uh, I followed uh, a poet, Kathleen Fraser, who I had met and heard read at the University of Iowa, and she became a mentor for me um, in San Francisco. And that's a completely different poetry scene, obviously, than um, even Iowa City was or, or the Midwest. It was sort of overwhelming, but it was also wonderful to be thrown into... You know, I lived a pretty bohemian life, worked in a movie theater making cappuccinos, and we didn't call them baristas then, <laughs> um, and, and went to school and, and read and walked and looked at the ocean and tried things I probably wouldn't have tried in Des Moines or Iowa City. And also, you mentioned my sister Joey. Both, both my sisters, Joey and Chris, and me too, always went to the art center and always took art classes, so I think I was always very um, influenced by visual art. And probably before I turned to really writing as my life's work, maybe thought I was gonna be an artist or mm -hmm. you know, do something in, in that way. So. Why don't you just briefly tell him who Joey is because she's so uh, renowned and I don't know as much about Chris, but I do know I follow Joey's career. Joey Kirkpatrick, my, uh, I'm the oldest of four daughters, and then Chris, who's a magnificent uh, teacher in Des Moines, and the one we would want all our children to be in her classroom. Um, and then Joey was the third, and she uh, is now pretty much internationally known as a glass artist and painter, sculptor. She and her partner, Flora Mace, have worked together for over 30 years. They were both mentored by Dale Chihuly and now are really colleagues of his and uh, kind of have set the standard for women in, in blowing glass. In blowing and glass. Yeah, it's it's yeah. phenomenal and she lives in the Seattle area right. and it's, it is astounding to you know, walk into a museum right. and see a piece of someone you went to high school with. Exactly. It's lovely. So I just I, did it in Boston. Oh, and yeah, I, it, even though Boston, I knew right. her work was there, to yeah. be in the Boston Museum of mm. Fine Arts and Wonderful. see Joey Kirkpatrick. Of course, I taught her everything she of knows. Of course. Well, and it's interesting that you thought of yourself in visual terms. So mm -hmm. I think as a writer myself, and I, I, was a, I went to college and wrote poetry, mm. so um, uh, I don't do it now. Mm. Here you are, you. Uh, but the uh, I the visual elements of your work mm -hmm. are very powerful, and and Thank so you. I think that uh, comes through that you that appreciation is uh, informing uh, mm -hmm. all your senses are working when mm -hmm. you're doing this. So the fact that we are a visual culture and you're writing visually is mm -hmm. probably makes maybe one of the things that the committee appreciated about your work when giving you this this award. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, who knows? I think I'm very influenced by what I see and what I remember. And um, I think it was Faulkner that said the three things a writer needs are uh, observation, memory, and imagination. And I always say to students, I have no imagination, which of course isn't true, but um, those other things are really strong for me. So, mm -hmm. And um, they, they definitely come through in the work. Mm -hmm. So um, just briefly tell us about the other, so you've published multiple books or I couple? published a children's book called Plowy a story from the prairie and actually my sister Joey's paintings it's a picture book yes, are there and it was uh, the visuals for that um, are the Iowa Living History Farm which is just outside of Des Moines the story is actually a story from our grandmother um, and I also published a first book of poetry, and I had sent out my poetry manuscript for that for 16 years. <laughs> oh, no. 16 years, just so everybody gets a sense of what <laughs> a life in poetry can be like. And that's either brave or, or stupid, who, who knows? And so it's, it's kind of amazing to me with this book, the, the first place I sent it, it was not only accepted, but has won a number of awards. Um, Persistence so, matters. I think it does. Uh -huh. I, I think it does. And obviously it wasn't driven. And as, as I was driving here, there was a, a introduction on the radio. As I said, on Talk of the Nation, they were saying 
the, uh, the life of the poet, the um, solitary and occasional public life of the poet. <laughs> I was thinking, how true for you then? So you had this very public part starting back. You had this distorted, if you will, Right. sense of the publicness right. of the poet. Right. I do think it was distorted, yeah, in, in a good in a, way, in a but a sweet way. way. It, right. it encouraged right. you, uh, but it is a solitary mm -hmm. practice, and, and I think that also comes through mm. in the book itself. So why don't you talk a little bit about um, the title of the book is Odessa. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us a little bit about kind of what the, some of the themes sure. that you're writing about and why the title, we'll cover a few things. Well, Odessa is actually the name of a tiny Minnesota town that's on the border of Minnesota and South Dakota, 313 people. Um, and I, let's see, when was this? I guess around 2005, 2006, I had received a grant from the Loft and the McKnight Foundation here and had started driving out to see that prairie on a regular basis. I was very interested in seeing how or seeing the landscape that Robert Bly, James Wright, Paul Gruco, Carol Bly, uh, Phoebe Hansen, many really outstanding writers, Thomas McGrath, had written about. And it was thrilling to see that landscape, but uh, this little town of Odessa, which has a very small, uh, I guess you'd call it a jail or a prison uh, that's still on the National Historic Register, no floor, no insulation, just brick walls, and... So a dirt floor. A dirt floor, mm -hmm. uh-huh. And it haunted me, the, the idea of 1913, such a place being built and still standing, and who might have been put there. And the other thing I would say is that I felt a very strong presence of a culture, a civilization that was invisible, and I think those were the Dakota people. Um, and I had Dakota students at the time, and so that became a real thing, uh, influencing me and informing me. And then I got a brain tumor. <laughs> so everything changed at that point. I wasn't able to drive out there anymore. Um, it was a very serious um, tumor. Um, I was very lucky to have it removed. It was the size of a baseball, discovered very suddenly. and. Um, learned how to walk again, went to the Sister Kenny Institute here in St. Paul in Minneapolis, and got very interested in the language of uh, not only a craniotomy um, and the name of the tumor and the lobe in the brain that the tumor was on, but the language of anatomy and also the sense of self that develops or changes when something as profound as one's brain has been touched and, shall we say, tampered with. Mm -hmm. Hold on. If you're just joining us, I'm speaking with Patricia Kirkpatrick, a poet and recent winner of the Minnesota Book Award. So, the, so I was saying so the language of the, language of of the of both brain anatomy, brain surgery, brain neuroscience. Um, uh, at Roosevelt in Des Moines, the high school we both went to, I was looking out the window when we had chemistry and physics <laughs> and biology. I wasn't paying much attention. And what was interesting to me about that language was how much of it overlapped with uh, words from natural history, the core of the earth, the mantle of the earth, the lobe, um, oh, yeah. a lot of mm -hmm. those things. And I guess as a poet, language is always just interesting to me in its own uh, right. Um, also, there's the end of, the mar of a marriage in the book, and there's language from the legal system. and. After brain tumor, you have to do a lot of things to get yourself back to where you were. I was really lucky that that happened for me. It doesn't always happen for people. For some reason, I wanted to learn the mythology and the goddesses, so I just made all these flashcards to learn about them, and it was, it was a helpful thing to do to rebuild the neurons. Um, and I got very taken by Persephone, and so then I started reading a lot of Greek mythology and the story of her being abducted by Hades, who was the um, the brother of Zeus, who was the ruler of the world, and she was taken to the underworld. And I was trying to figure out how that story would fit in a Midwestern, and particularly a prairie mm -hmm. setting. So I guess those are the, th those are themes, the themes for, for me. Mm -hmm. Would you read sure. uh, the, uh, the one we just talked about that relates to your experience at United Hospital? Sure. 
which is an invisible life too, the way I was saying out on the prairie, there's the invisible life of other cultures and civilizations being there. When you're in that kind of uh, situation and you see not only the suffering of other people, but the incredible skill that is able to be extended to people who uh, are injured or ill. This is Letter from United, and it's United Hospital right down the street here in St. Paul. Letter from United. Of course I heard voices in the night, saw visions, felt the presence of dying, that white fringed place. Shallow breath, narrow entrance, the door to death opened. Them came, then came steroids and lack of inhibition. There was terror, I admit it. Just before I learned the news, I realized all you have meant to me, and I thought I had too much feeling to continue to spend time with you. I had a brain tumor, and it had to come out. Damage, seizure and aura, the gray dome of the growth, or a cathedral lit at the top where the cross is. Flora wrote, so much of life we find in the funniest places. Boundaries, love, bone, cutting, and stitches. More blood than the surgeon had ever ordered. I knew I needed your help for the children, the family I might have to leave. I am writing to say I can make the changes. I am writing to say I have been opened and closed. I am writing to say that today when the nurse came to change my dressing, she glanced up and said, oh look, is that snow? We looked out the window and saw it together, first flakes of those white fringed birds flying, the first snow of the new season. Very hopeful. I think it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it Very is. Very hopeful. Yeah, I think it is. And doesn't, doesn't flinch, but it's, um, you, you paint quite a picture for us. Thank My you. view from the hospital was the cathedral. Yeah. And, uh, St. Paul, which many of us see nice. every day. And that, again, the globe of the yeah. cathedral and the, and so you the saw dome those of the, right. So, um, so you write about this brain tumor and the experience, um, and you do also then connect to the landscape as well. Um, and, and then it, what I'm interested in too is that you've, you've expressed sort of what the inquiry process for mm -hmm. you, in a sense, so the life of the writer is, uh, you know, sometimes I think the best books are someone has a question they want to answer mm -hmm. and they spend, you know, the, the process of the book right. exploring their answer or answers mm -hmm. to that question. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a similar experience or do you see it? I mean, it sounds to me like you had a question about Odessa. I mean, that's part of where you started I, from. I think an, an original question was what happens when one people or one civilization overtakes another and I think we know some of the answers to that. It's, uh, it's tragic in many ways. But then when I went through the experience of the brain tumor and craniotomy and surgery and rehabilitation, and that does inform the book. It's not an autobiography. Everything that's in the book did not happen exactly the way uh, it's, it's said here. But um, that question then became what happens to a person when they are so physically changed? Is there a self that remains stable or is that very inner core self changed too? And that's been a subject that poets have been sort of obsessed with for the last 50 years anyway. <laughs> so I thought I had new, I mean, I think technology brings us to different things in when we think about the soul and the self and daily life and uh, you know, someone touched my brain. Does that change me forever, or was that just a physical mm -hmm. thing? So. That does give any of us pause. Um, and how long was that recovery? I mean, I, I love the fact that you've talked about the, uh, you've, you've given credit to that process, the Sister Kinney Institute, and uh, the process. I mean, there's this um, relationship of recovery, mm -hmm. of the physical recovery, the emotional recovery, mm -hmm. uh, and you write about some mm -hmm. of that. What's the um, what? What more can you share with us about that process? How long was that taking? And it's still ongoing for it you. Is, I would say it is still ongoing. Uh, I was in the rehabilitation center for three weeks after the surgery, and then I went home. I had learned to walk. Um, 
Now, most of the physical things came back pretty quickly, although learning to walk again is is pretty major change for someone. Emotionally, it was uh, very hard for me. Crowds were difficult, um, surprises, things that I didn't expect. I had very s extreme reactions to things, which aren't necessarily a bad thing for a poet uh, to have that kind of emotional reaction to many things. Um, I think my son uh, said it best. He used to drive me down to the brain tumor support group and he'd say, Mom, I don't know why you're going to this support group anymore. You don't have a brain tumor. <laughs> sort of over and done. Um, and then people would ask him, uh, how's your mom? How's your mom doing? And he said, well, my mom is still my mom, but she's just not herself for as long a period of time. And oh, what isn't a nice that, isn't, description. Isn't that, you know, and I, I <laughs> wow, think that that kind. was... I thought it was very kind, very insightful, and I think that is one of the questions that's that's being explored in the book. Not only my own experience, but what happens to any of us when we lose a job we've done for most of our life, or a marriage ends, or our health has been compromised in a way that will never be returned to us the way it was before. So um, I, I think that's really the question that's motivating the poems forward in this book. And I hope that that works for other readers as they read it. Mm -hmm. So as you think about this life-changing experience mm -hmm. and as you describe what you just did, there's a, do you experience a sense of, of um, uh, things falling away that aren't as important? Are there, uh, is there a new focus in your life? How do you, how do you see that now? I would say that the main change was just the writing of the book because there was a time where I didn't know how long I was going to live. I don't mean to sound melodramatic, but, and I was very clear of what I wanted to do if that were the case. I wanted to spend time with my children and my friends, and I wanted to write something that I gave myself to fully, and I sort of felt that I'd lost everything there was to lost, lose, so um, I had nothing to lose. And I, I also would say one thing that happened, I don't know how typical this is for surgery patients, brain patients, and it all depends on where the tumor is. It, you know, it's going to affect different things in different places. But I found that the part of my brain that would censor things before they hit the page that would say, that's not a good idea, don't put that down, <laughs> was really diminished. And that helped, too. And maybe so, that just made it the yeah. award winner it is. I don't know. I that's, don't know. That's beautiful. So, well, I'm excited that it that had that left. Not that you had to go through what you went through, but I'm excited that you turned it into something so beautiful. Let's talk just for a second with a little bit of time we have. There's a specialness. Not only getting the award is fantastic. The Minnesota Book Awards are a great uh, recognition. You have a great publisher in Milkweed Editions. Uh, but you also have a special, a very special award. Tell us a little bit about that. This book won something called the Lindquist and Venom uh, Poetry Prize. Uh, it was the first year that the prize was offered. The prize is uh, offered through a foundation supported by the uh, Lindquist and Venom law firm. There was an attorney there, Richard Erig, uh, who really cared and loved poetry, and he wanted to establish this prize. And when he went to Milkweed, he you know, presented the idea to them, and of course they were thrilled. What what publisher doesn't want to, you know, mm -hmm. take on those kind of resources? But he wanted it to be done very fast. And so the award last year was announced in April of 2012, and the foundation and Mr. Irig wanted the book to be published within the same year, wow. which usually takes Much, two books, yeah. to, two years for a book to mm -hmm. come out. Well, that was great to me not to have to wait for those two years. The book was published. It's been pretty well received. And just this month, uh, the second award has been given to a, a woman poet in Wisconsin. The book, or the award goes to uh, six states, the two uh, Dakotas, Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, and um, I guess that's five only. So it, it's an award to bring attention to Midwe Midwest writers. Um, there is a ten thousand dollar prize that my goes goodness, with it, so that, that's a lot of money oh for gosh, for poetry. But really, I I find that the the attention is is really worth more even than the money. Um, you know, writing every day, just as you said, um, being especially many poets are introverts. Um, 
almost have to work not to be hermits. But writing any kind of art is not about awards. Um, and there's something subjective about who does and who doesn't get them. But they do bring the attention to, to the artist, to the writer, and they bring the work to a public. And so that's one wonderful thing that mm -hmm. was, has happened and I think will continue to happen through this particular award. And probably the book awards have, you know, do the same kind of thing for readers and writers. So. Well, one of the things I loved about your, um, uh, I read about your acknowledgement, I wasn't in the audience, but you acknowledged that also at the book awards there were uh, people accepting in Ojibwe and mm -hmm. in the uh, native languages. Right. And uh, it brings attention to all kinds of important things. So um, really wonderful. So we want to be sure that people know that they can pick up the book and we will announce you have a website that they can. Coming up. Yeah. Coming up. I, okay. I wasn't able to say what the address That's is, okay. but it'll be up we'll, we'll within the week. We'll post it for but, but it, uh, encourage people to uh, go to your website and um, look, up, look you up online. And uh, I found the book in my neighborhood um, love uh, that. <laughs> yes, Macabre's, which I love, but um, uh, it's in it's in Barnes and Noble mm -hmm. and on Amazon, and mm -hmm. it's called Odessa. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say, don't be afraid to read poetry. Um, I would definitely say <laughs> that, <laughs> and in and, and enjoy it. And um, uh, I don't think we have time for another poem, but I really thank you for joining us. Thanks for joining us on the forum. That's all we have time for. Come back again next week. Thank you.